Alex? I haven't seen Alex. Have you seen Alex? No. I I don't know where Alex went. Oh. Who is Alex? I don't oh, know. Is it okay? Wait, the blue shirt guy? Yeah. yeah. I think yeah. he's at Panera. Oh, okay. Are you a third grader? No. Are you a third grader? No. Are you a third grader? Or do you know a third grader? Well, then you should come to our Bible presentation. We're presenting Bibles in both traditional and modern worship August 15th at 11 a.m. Registration is required, so head over to cumc.com slash Bible to get started. Hey, are you tired of Little Church? Then come to Camp Big Church. On August 15th from 2 to 3.30 p.m., we're having Camp Big Church. The afternoons will be meant for students and parents to learn the importance of being in worship. Children will be led by Meredith McBride in the Sanctuary and Modern Worship space and learn all of the ins and outs of coming to church. They'll learn how to follow along in the service, the symbolism and importance of the worship space, and so much more. Big Church! Hey, hey ladies. ladies! Are you feeling a little dull? Are you feeling like a plastic bag, drifting through the wind, wanting to start again? Then you should come to the Women's Refresh event! At the Refresh event, you're going to refresh yourself, your mind, your faith, your purpose, and your community. We'll have a fabulous team of experts, a hilarious female comedian, and seasoned speakers joining us for a day full of music, treats, learning, and laughs. Register at cumc.com slash refresh. Last but not least, August 8th is our Back to School Sunday, and we have a lot of events going on, including Promotion Sunday and Blessing of the Backpacks. We're also going to have our youth block party, which isn't just a party for blocks. We're going to have food, friendship, and a color war. We're also starting our choir rehearsals back up that day, so be sure to come and check it out. If you have any questions regarding service today, reach out to one of our volunteers in the lobby or if you are online, please send an email to cumc at cumc.com. Thanks again for joining us. And we all hope you have an amazing day. Good morning. Welcome to Christ United. We are so excited that you're here. Things look a little bit different. Jim Wilson took a vacation. Can you believe that? How dare he? So Mason's on the keys right now. <laughs> but we're so excited. Will you stand and join us in worship?
watching on Facebook to like or comment to let us know that you are with us. It may be obvious to some of you, but Paris mentioned some things changed. Jim Wilson isn't here, correct. But also, there are these tables with communion on it. So, <laughs> uh, it makes me real nervy, but we're going to try it. Um, we're going to try to take communion today. We're going to do it. We're going to accomplish it together. So we will still have an option for those of you who don't feel comfortable coming to the table. We have uh, some pre-packaged stations. We always have gluten-free. I'll get into all of that. We want everyone to feel welcome, and we are excited to take this step together and do communion in a new way that we have not done in quite some time. And I have a few announcements to highlight. I hope you enjoyed the two senior girls on the video. They are a hoot. They were quoting Katy Perry for part of that, so they are a mess. Okay, the first announcement I have this morning is Camp Big Church. This is a new thing that we are doing, and the idea is that we want, it, we want children to learn that they are welcomed and valued in worship. We want them here with us. So this is a Sunday afternoon with Meredith, and she is going to take children around to the modern worship space and the traditional worship space and get them comfortable, show them what things are, tell them what happens during worship. We are so excited about this. So if you have any kiddos in your life, we would love for them to join us on this Sunday camp. Big Church uh, event. The last thing I have this morning is that next Sunday is Back to School Sunday. I can't believe it. Today is August 1st. There are actually some school districts, I believe, that start school tomorrow. Uh, so if that's not you, lucky. Feel some luckiness right now. But for everyone else, next Sunday, August 8th, we want you to bring your backpacks. I don't care if you're going into elementary school, college, anything, you are welcome to bring your backpack. Maybe you're getting your master's degree. We want to pray over, we want to bless your backpack this school year. Teachers, maybe you have a favorite pencil you want to bring. We would love to pray over that pencil or pen. I don't know. I'm just talking now. So, but next week, it's a big uh, shebang. We are going to celebrate going back to school. Our students in both children's and youth will actually be promoted to the next grade next week. Um, so all of that is happening. It's going to be a very exciting Sunday, and we hope you and your families will join us here next Sunday. Today we are 
wrapping up our second Corinthian sermon series. It is uh, Communion Sunday, so it's going to be a briefer homily, uh, but I have enjoyed diving deeper into Second Corinthians with all of you. So I thank you uh, for that journey, for coming alongside me. Uh, it has been really cool to hear more about Paul and his relationship with that church at Corinth. So let's now affirm our faith together. Let's say what we believe together as a body of Christ. We belong to God, eternal and infinite, creator of all things and all that is to come. We follow Christ who comes to us from God and reveals God to us. He heals people and transforms lives and calls us to join in his ministry. He was crucified, died, and was raised by God and reigns over all creation. And he bids us to die and rise with him in the service of the healing of the world. We live by the Spirit, together with the communion of saints, as members of the body of Christ, God's holy universal church. We are confident in the forgiveness of sin, the power of resurrection, and the reality of eternal life. In all things, it is our desire to follow Christ by the grace of the Holy Spirit, for God's glory. Amen. Amen. Will you stand and sing with us? Oh! 
feel it you're working even when i don't feel it you're working you never stop you never stop working you never stop you never stop working even when i don't see it you're working even when i don't feel it you're working you never stop you never stop working you never stop oh even when i don't see it you're working even when i don't feel it you're working you never stop you never stop working oh you never stop no even when i don't feel it you're working even when i don't see it you're working you never stop you never stop working you never stop Promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Oh, way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Oh, way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. We make a miracle worker, promise keeper. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Amen. You may be seated. So this week, we're not going to have a normal children's time video, but we're going to be going into a children's update with not only Meredith, but also Chris and Stephanie. So let's watch. Did you miss me? Did you think we weren't doing children's time anymore? Well, we're back, baby, and we are shaking things up. Children's time will resume at the 11 o'clock worship services because at 945, we want to see all of your smiling faces in Sunday school. I am so excited to continue this special time with you all on Sunday mornings. Sometimes we'll be doing videos like this, but we will also be able to do children's time in person. Sometimes it'll be me leading them. And sometimes it's going to be me, and I'm really excited about that. Sometimes it'll be me. Whoever's doing children's time that particular week, it's an important part of who we are here at Christ United. Uh, you know, I've been preaching for a while now, and every time I hear a child in the sanctuary, whether they're a little fidgety or they make a little bit of noise, uh, it makes me smile because it's a sign of life, new life, uh, ongoing life in the church. And I guess here I'm really talking to the adults, both the parents of kids who are in worship with us and uh, those who don't have children. Uh, an important part of our spiritual journey is worship in the context of the community of faith and teaching children how to be in worship is an important part of our work together as a congregation. Children's time is a piece of that, helping children feel welcome because we have a, a particular moment of the service that's really for them, uh, but then also a sense of hospitality and excitement when we see kids in worship uh, is essential as well. I'm excited about children's time. I think it's been an, a wonderful thing that we've added during the pandemic, and I'm excited to resume it as we head into the fall. In modern worship, children's time has become an important part of worship. We love having kids in our worship space anyways, whether they're giggling or crying or somewhere in between. We think their joy, their noise is an integral part of who we are and how we worship together. We want our families to know that kids are always welcome in this space, that they can move and dance and be a part of worship just like everyone else. So whether you are in the modern service or the traditional service, you will still be getting your regularly scheduled children's time fix. We are so excited to continue to share the love of God with you on Sunday mornings. Never forget, God is with you everywhere you go, and each and every one of you is, is a beloved, beloved child of God. God. That was a little cheesy at the end. Thank you uh, for bearing with us during that. <laughs> 
But I do want to reiterate, uh, the lights are going to come on, trust me, I'm talking until they do. Uh, I do want to reiterate that, yeah, let there be light, uh, that children are always welcome in this space. Uh, mine just started walking, and so as I preach, he may get a little anxious to see me. So I would love your grace in knowing that he is welcome in this space, even if he starts running down a center aisle, it's going to be great. Uh, but we have always been known uh, in modern worship as being a place where kids can dance, where they can cry out, um, and I just hope that you will always welcome them into this space and cherish them just as much as I do, and I know so many of you do. Will you pray with me? God, may the words of my heart and mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. This is the last week of our Second Corinthians sermon series, and it has been a long one, and you are all amazing for going through it with me. I am thankful last week Paige actually preached in modern worship here, and she preached about generosity and did a great job. She covered the eighth and ninth chapter of Second Corinthians. And before we go into ours today, I want to do a quick recap because we are at the end, and it is a heavy hitting letter that we have just finished. Paul writes this letter to the church at Corinth. While it's listed as Second Corinthians in our Bibles, it was probably more realistic to say that it's actually the fifth or sixth letter to the Corinthians, not necessarily the second. They started the church at Corinth as this really strong community, these first believers of Christ. But then Paul left them and started traveling to spread the word to other places. And when Paul left, they kind of swayed in their faith. They strayed away from what Paul had been teaching them about Christ. They started listening to some other guys who were coming in the name of Jesus, but who Paul says were not really genuine followers of Christ. It's kind of a whole mess. Paul seeks reconciliation with this church at Corinth. Paul apologizes to them throughout 2 Corinthians for the times that he's let them down. And he asks that they will allow the power of Jesus to transform them into new creations. New creations where they practice this radical generosity and mold their lives to point others to Jesus Christ. Today, as we finish up this letter, we will be focusing on the 10th through 13th chapters, the last three chapters of 2 Corinthians. This portion of the letter is actually considered to be fragments of an even later letter. <laughs> if you have been reading along in 2 Corinthians with us, you can tell that some of the things Paul brushed off earlier in the book now seem very urgent and must be addressed. These are the type of keys that we see throughout the scripture that tells us that something's changed, that maybe this letter was written at a different time because the situation seems more dire. Things seem more urgent than they did earlier on. And uh, the tech team has the timeline I showed us that very first week. So this is really the way we should think of the letters. V1 is Paul's first visit to Corinth. That's when the church is first established. And then there's actually this warning letter that has been lost. And so technically that would be Paul's first letter to the church at Corinth. Then letter B is what we have today in our scriptures as 1 Corinthians. Then we have Paul's second visit. Then we hear all this reference in 2 Corinthians about a harsh letter but we don't have a harsh letter. So it's assumed that, that has been another, that's another letter that's been lost. So that would be letter C. Letter D is what we have covered up to this point, chapters 1 through 9 of 2 Corinthians. That is actually considered the, that letter of um, D, is what we're calling it, A, B, C, D, 4. There we go, the fourth letter. And then letter E is what we are covering today. And that is considered to be fragments of an even later letter, a fifth. Or maybe there's other letters that have been lost and we just don't have them. So fifth or more letter is what we are covering today. And then it's assumed that Paul did make a third visit to the church at Corinth. This comes from uh, some writings throughout Acts and Romans. Uh, so if you want to go deeper, once again, I suggest Jamie Clark Souls has a book entitled First Corinthians. 
Philippians, but it really gives us a lot of background into the people as they are even in 2 Corinthians. Okay. Timeline over. So we are focusing on chapter 10 through 13. They're fragments of another letter. We can, we're good with that. We're cool with that. Lovely. Perfect. Whatever the original composition may have included, these last few chapters are important and they stand surprisingly well on their own. 10, 11, 12, 13. I keep saying three. It's really four, huh? Math is not a strong suit, friends. The last four chapters of 2 Corinthians. And it is in these last four chapters that we get an important glimpse into Paul's identity. If I were to ask all of us here today, what is something you know about Paul? You might shout things out like, he was a writer. Yeah, he wrote all these letters. He was imprisoned. Yes, also true. Maybe someone yells out, he used to be named Saul. Yes, he used to be named Saul. He was Jewish. He's often assumed to be a Pharisee. We know for sure that he persecuted Christians when he was Saul. And if we kept throwing out all these things we know about Paul, one of you may mention hey, isn't it written somewhere that Paul had a thorn in his side? Have you all heard this before? Yeah, is that something you associate with Paul? Let's read about it. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 8. Paul writes this, I was given a thorn in my body, because of the outstanding revelations I've received so that I wouldn't be conceited. It's a messenger from Satan sent to torment me so that I wouldn't be conceited. I pleaded with the Lord three times for it to leave me alone. Now, there are many speculations as to what Paul is referring to when he says there is this thorn in my body. We're pretty sure it wasn't a literal thorn because you think you could just pull it out, right? It'd be fine. So it's fair to assume it was something more. It was something that kind of hindered the way he did his everyday life. It could have been an ailment or some type of impediment. And there's really absolutely no way for any of us to know what this thorn in Paul's side is. Scholars have read and read and read letters that weren't even published in the Bible or part of what we consider scripture, and there's just not a clear answer as to what this thorn in the side was. Now, if you learn something and think you really know, please tell me. But from what I found, I cannot find any clear answers. Tons of speculations, but no clear answers. And it's kind of fun to speculate, right? To think about, huh, what was that thing that Paul struggled with? It seems like we're all kind of drawn to noticing weaknesses in other people. My family and I earlier this week were watching the NBA draft because... That's what people do these days in COVID. And as we were watching all these young people uh, get signed to teams, the sports analyst would talk about the player that was just drafted. And they would say, oh, they're so good at this and this and this, but, and then they would go on and on about this person's weakness. Man, they're really weak from the free throw line or their defense could really use some work and just would go on about the weakness of this great athlete that was just drafted into the NBA. Weaknesses are something that sometimes are easy to talk about in other people. We all have weaknesses. My question for us today is why do we feel like we need to point out weaknesses in other people? Does it make us feel better? I think when we look and consider other people's weaknesses, we have to be so super clear on what our motivation truly is in doing so. 
Because that motivation reveals something about who we are. And honestly, before we can even focus on pointing out someone else's weakness, we need to be in a solid headspace where we can take an accurate inventory of our own weaknesses. Because like I said, we all have them, friends. It is really easy to build ourselves up on others' weaknesses, to point out where we see others fail and kind of hide our own truth, our own weaknesses about ourselves. But if we are going to talk about weaknesses today, if we're going to pay attention to Paul's life, to this insight that Paul himself had this weakness, then we have to be real and honest about the weaknesses in each of our lives, too. What is something you consider a weakness in your life? You don't have to shout it out. Keep it inside. (laughs) Between you and God, maybe your spouse or best friend. Can you think of one? Maybe you can think of a few. It can be anything. It can be something innate, something that you don't really have any control over. It can also be a weakness that's maybe a bad habit or something you use as a crutch. Some of our weaknesses can be things that need to be remedied. And other times our weaknesses can't be fixed, but they can be acknowledged and built upon. Other weaknesses actually lend themselves to developing different strengths within us. In the 90s and early 2000s, a restaurant concept spread across across Europe. It was called Dining in the Dark. Its concept was twofold. It was intended to give diners who dined in pitch black spaces or were blindfolded the opportunity to temporarily forfeit one of their senses, sight. The idea is that when they gave up sight, these other senses would be heightened. It was also intended to give space to those who were blind or visually impaired, to connect with people in a unique setting, to give them an opportunity to play up to their strength of navigating in the darkness. There are still restaurants today where you can dine in the dark in order to get a more intense dining experience. And there's actual science behind this theory. There are numerous studies that show when a person is born without sight or maybe without hearing, that if they lose one of their senses early in childhood, their brain doesn't just shut down on that part that dealt with it. Instead, the other senses continue to send information to that part of the brain. So even though someone may not be able to see, that part of the brain doesn't just shut down and black out. Senses fill in the space and connect dots. They make up that difference. A researcher at Stanford put it this way, the unaffected senses take up the responsibilities of the affected sense. While some may consider having impaired sight or hearing to be a weakness, it's actually something that lends to strengthening of other senses. Weaknesses aren't always something we're super proud of. They can sometimes be things that really stand in the way of us being our true selves. And still, sometimes, they can lead to even better newer, bigger things. Let's continue in our passage. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. We'll pick up where we left off. Let's read verse 8 again. I pleaded with the Lord three times for it, the thorn in the side, to leave me alone. The Lord said to me, my grace is enough for you. 
because power is made perfect in weakness. So I'll gladly spend my time bragging about my weaknesses so that Christ's power can rest on me. Therefore, I'm all right with weaknesses, insults, disasters, harassments, and stressful situations for the sake of Christ. Because when I'm weak, then I'm strong. This is the word of God for the people of God. Let the church say, thanks be to God. Redemption is a huge part of Paul's theology. The idea that Jesus redeems our stories, Jesus redeems our identities, and that it's in that redemption that we are offered this truly deep love and grace. Paul asks God to take away his weaknesses. Paul begs God three times to take this thorn away from him. And instead of taking it away, God says, my grace is enough for you because power is made perfect in weakness. Yeah, it's true. Some of our weaknesses need to be changed. They need to be remedied. They need to be fixed. Hatred, selfishness, rudeness, those are all weaknesses that we can work on doing better at. And those weaknesses that we don't have control over, those things that are just a part of who we are, that others point out as weaknesses within us, those things can actually be redeemed by God and demonstrate the grace of our Christ with a love offered to all people. As we close the page on the story and the chapter and the people of 2 Corinthians, may we remember the message to the church. They were not abandoned They were challenged to love others and to spread the love of Jesus Christ to the world. They were called to be transformed into a new creation, to allow their weaknesses to be made strong through the grace of Christ. Friends, we too are not abandoned. We are challenged to love others and to spread the love of Jesus Christ to the world. We are called to be transformed into a new creation to allow each of those weaknesses that we talked about earlier that we have swirling around our head to be made strong through the the love, through the power, through the strength and grace of Christ. May it be so. This morning we have the opportunity to partake in Holy Communion with one another And it is an opportunity I am so glad we have this morning. Because when we talk about weakness, what better place to come to than the table? The table where we can lay it all over to Jesus Christ and be strengthened in his love and glory. I am uh, going to go through the liturgy in just a moment, but I want to walk us through what communion is going to look like because there are a lot of moving pieces this morning. We have a table here in the middle and a table right here. You are invited, if you are comfortable doing so, kneeling at the table and partaking in Holy Communion. We will. I will later in the service say the table is open and you are invited to come forward. I would ask that you spread out. If someone is in a particular spot, maybe don't bump up next to them. Uh, I know you love them dearly, but let's try to uh, be safe with one another this morning. You are welcome to spend as much time as you need praying. I know for some of you, maybe you haven't kneeled in a minute, and maybe it's just a space you need right now. If you do need a gluten-free option this morning, we have gluten-free wafers here at this little cart, and there's juice there to partake of as well. I get it that some people are not comfortable taking communion yet, or maybe you just don't want to be so close to your neighbors yet. So if that is the case for you, this morning we have, there's a table, a little round table on the end here, a stool here, and a round table at the end of these tables. And in each of those, there are baskets. Inside the baskets, are those pre-packaged communion elements that we have used. I will remind you the wafer is in the top layer and then the juice is under that. 
in each of those three baskets, there are also a gluten-free pre-packaged option. I'm telling you, we are doing everything we can to make you feel welcome and invited to the table this morning. This table, these tables, these elements, they do not belong to me. They do not belong to Christ United Methodist Church. They do not belong to the Methodist Church. This is the table of Jesus Christ. If you are open to God working in your life, you are welcome to partake of the elements. You don't have to have an affirmation uh, memorized. You don't have to know everything there is to know about the Bible. You don't even have to be so super sure about the whole God thing. We just ask that you're open to it. And if so, you are welcome to join us this morning in Holy Communion. We want it to be accessible for all. I want to remind you, too, that the juice is not wine. It is grape juice, so we do not want that to be a hindrance to anyone either. Let us join together in Holy Communion. The table of bread and juice is now to be made ready. This is the table of the company of Jesus and all who love him. It is the table of sharing with the poor of the world, with the weak, whom Jesus identified himself. It is the table of communion with the earth in which Christ became incarnate. So come to this table, you who have much faith and you who would like to have more, you who have been here often, and you who have not been for a long time, you who have tried to follow Jesus, and yes, you too, you who have failed, it is Christ alone who invites us to meet him here. On the night Christ gave of himself for us, he was gathered with his disciples, with his friends, with his community, and it was at that table that he took the bread gave thanks, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, to his dear, dear friends, and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Likewise, when the meal was over, Christ took the cup, gave thanks, gave it to his disciples, and said, drink from this, all of you. This is a sign of my new covenant, a love and grace poured out to all people for all time. As often as you drink from this cup, do so in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, today we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as we remember the mystery of faith that Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. God, pour out your Holy Spirit on all of us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and juice. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may go out into the world and be the hands and feet of God, redeemed by God's great love. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all of the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Amen. I invite you now with the confidence of children to join me as we pray together the prayer Christ taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The table is open.
down on my knees again, surrendering all, surrendering all. Find me here, Lord, as you draw me near, desperate for you. Desperate for you, and I surrender. Drench my soul as mercy and grace. Unfold a hunger and thirst, a hunger and thirst with arms stretched wide. I know you hear my cry. Speak to me now, oh, speak to me now. I surrender, I surrender, I want to know you more, I want to know you more, I surrender.
I forgot to say, we should have done offering at some point this morning. We have an offering box in the back. We are thankful for the ways we know you give to this congregation. I thank you in advance. After I give you a benediction, we're going to stand and sing the benediction we sang together since I started here. I invite you to lift your voices. And it just makes sense for us to end our time this morning with a benediction from 2 Corinthians. These are the last words. Paul gives to the church at Corinth. So as we leave this place and re-enter the world, finally, brothers and sisters, goodbye. Put things in order. Respond to my encouragement. Be in harmony with each other. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with each of you. Say hello to each other with a holy kiss. Maybe don't go that far. COVID, y'all. All of God's people say hello to you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Go forth strengthened and renewed. Amen. Amen. Let's sing this together. The Lord bless.